macroeconomics, but not the global business. But I've, I've you know, the at the end of this marketing class, there's a 15 page or yeah, 12 page and 15 slide PowerPoint due at the end of 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 this one also. Yep. So lots of work, lots of work. You're gonna get real good at PowerPoint. I know. I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty good at it. Not 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 too shabby. I can uh, I can muddle my way through that. Well, I don't my last my first one last. Never first had to build one. Yeah, never had to build one. You know, I was always I was always the guy who was in charge of setting up the technology to display them and everything else. And you know, people come me, oh, I don't know how to do it. And I like this stuff, like the WebEx stuff. I've been hundreds of these, but actually <laughs> building it or setting it up, that costs money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you'll. I'm sure. I'm sure it looks good. How are you guys? Cool. Is that Steve? That's me. Good How evening, doing, Steve. Unfortunately, I can't get this stupid thing to share my desktop. I might have to log out, and log back in. Give me a minute. I'm going to log back out. I'll be right back. All right. <laughs> My vote is give us credit for, for being <laughs> in class yep. and A's on the assignments, and we'll call it good. I like the way you think, and I certainly would do that if I was a student, too. <laughs> um, but now it won't let me exit without killing you guys also. Uh, Please don't kill us. I, I will do my best to not kill you. Um, the weather's too nice to kill us. It's right there, and it just it's grayed out. I don't understand why. You know what, you know what I wonder? But it, I wonder if oh, it's you because, gotta pass the hockey puck. Yeah, I wonder if it's because yeah. I logged in first. There you go. There, hang on, share my desktop. There we go. There we yeah, go. I was in first last week and I just did it as soon as you came in the door, but I forgot and this had. Okay, so can you guys see my desktop now? Yes, Dan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, Rachel. Hi. So we got a whopping three. I thought it was, you know, went so well last week that everybody would want to be here. All the good students are here. <laughs> <laughs> and since none of the rest of them right. um, heard that, they can't take it personally, right? That's right. If they, you know, if they would have been on time and here, then you know, they could have been part of the cool kids. <laughs> All right. Because I think they are the cool kids. Yeah, yeah, they're they're out they're outside uh, riding bikes and uh, enjoying the weather right now. Yeah, we're the studious kids. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, so we want to slam into this thing and see how quickly we can get it done? Sure. Okay, yeah, so do it. you guys obviously all read Chapter 6 and 7 already. Let me bring up uh, this. So you were supposed to turn in Chapters 4 and 5, mm -hmm. probably, probably four problems on each, and Quiz 3. Uh, sometime prior to right now. And then uh, chapters 6 and 7, and then we have the uh, project due next week, and obviously last week and this week I haven't done any grading. Uh, so I'm going to obviously give you guys some grace on that, but I'm hoping that I will get caught up with grading by this week. And then that should give you feedback on project part 1 in time to be able to, to work on project part two. But if I don't get you feedback in time for it to be useful for you, then um, I will certainly give you grace on that. Only for you three, though, because you have to do it. OK, so any I questions like, about like like what was due? You like that. <laughs> <laughs> any questions about what was due and where um, we're going from here? All nope. of it. <laughs> <laughs> All of which. Um, okay, the joint, the joint, uh, the joint um, table. The is joint table. Sorry, is this a Washington you... and Colorado kind of question? That's awesome. <laughs> um, I think it was on the Quinn, and it was a joint. Where is it? Oh, construct a joint probability table for this data. Which which 
chapter are we talking about? Oh, sorry, that was the quiz. Never mind. Quiz chapter three? Yeah. Or quiz three, I mean? Or, yeah. Do you want to, are you saying you want to go over that now, or do you just want me to give you feedback on it when I look at your quiz? Oh, you can give me feedback on it. That's fine. Okay. I will do that. Uh, yeah, I, I will give everybody, you know, on the file itself, I will add comments to the file itself. And then when I get caught up with that grade, grading, if everybody has uh, similar types of problems, I'll go over that exact uh, concept. If it's going to be helpful for several people. But if, you know, just one person has an issue with it, I'll just give you a comment right off the Excel file itself. All righty. So chapter six, sections one through three. So when I actually did the reading and the prep for it, I had didn't have the syllabus in front of me, and I looked at six dot four as well, which is the exponential uh, uh, distribution. So we will obviously not do that tonight, and just do one through three. So remember, we've been talking about descriptive statistics up to this point, and uh, hang on, I'm going to cough. Hopefully that mute worked for you guys. Um, so we've been talking about descriptive statistics up to this point, and then chapter five we got into distributions, which is again a way of describing how data looks. This chapter six is continuing that discussion of how data looks. And then we'll be done with descriptive statistics. When we get to chapter seven tonight, then we're going to start with our very first getting our feet wet in. Um, inferential statistics. So for right now, we're going to finish up the, the descriptive statistics by looking at the last and most important of the um, distributions, which is the normal distribution. So that means I can skip through all that. Let me clarify discrete versus continuous. When we were counting up, you know, there was this many that was an average of 10. There was this many or not the average of 10, but this many that measured 10. There was 6 that measured 10, and there was 12 that measured 11. We would graph those, and we put up a bar chart that so showed this one is this high, and this one is this high. It looks something like that. We are measuring a discrete value. It's always going to be exactly a number, a whole integer number. So what we're talking about when we start talking about continuous distributions is if, there, if the value can be in between. It could be a 2.3, you know, and the value would between, be between those. How do I look at that kind of distribution? So when we start talking about continuous uh, distributions, the value could be any, not just an integer, not just a, a whole number with no decimal. It could be any real number, which means plus or minus any number of decimal places, 1.12345689. You know, nine decimal places later, it's still a real number, but it's not an integer. So a continuous distribution will work for non-integer values. That make sense? Yeah. Rachel, you're the only one with your mic not on, so good. I'm glad it made sense to you. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can you guys can see the participants list, right? That I have right here on my screen. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So you can see with People show up if anybody does. Okay, so that's the idea behind a, a continuous probability. Now, when I go back, oops, when I go back to here, when we wanted to know what the odds are that it would be a three, I could count it up. And this this y-axis right here is a little confusing for me. But you know, there was one that was a one. There was two that was a two. There was maybe five. It's hard to tell. There were threes, and I can add up the total number, and I could say, you know, it's five out of eighteen. That's the probability of getting a 3 is 5 out of 18. So if I want to know the probability of getting this, uh, then what I have to do instead of looking at what the height of that is, is I look at the area. Because it could be the value I'm looking for could be between here and here. So if it's 2.1 or 2.2, you know, I'm between those two values. So I look at the area rather than the height. So it's the width times the height is what gives me the probability that I'm going to get that value. Okay, compare that. Essentially here, we're treating this as if it has no width. Because there's no range on that number. The range on that number is zero. 
when I go to here, there's a range of the value that it could be. So if I say it's greater than two and less than three, there's an infinite number of sections that I could divide that one unit increment into. And that's why I use the area to calculate what the uh, probability of it being in that spot of that curve. That's the big difference between a continuous curve and a discrete uh, probability curve. So what I'm saying is I have a 100% probability that this is the function that, I, that I've defined. Whatever shape it happens to be, I have a 100% probability that it's going to be between these values, whatever I dictate these values are. And in this case, instead of being a function shape curve like that, what I've defined here is uniform. It's always going to be between B and A, and it will never be outside of that range. But it also has equal likelihood of being any value between B and A. That's what it means by uniform. I have the exact same probability of being any one of those of any one of those values. So in this case, uh, let me see. I thought there was one. Well, so in this case, here's my A and here's my B. I have the exact same probability of any points along this line between B and A. Uniform, same probability. Uh, so again, this is just a, a, a very basic distribution. So when I have a, a uniform distribution, my expected value, the average, is going to be the middle of that. So any given time, I could be this, I could be this, I could, you know, I don't know, can you guys see my little cross, my cross arrows there? It could be here, it could be here, but I have the exact same probability everywhere Therefore, my expected average value is always going to be exactly in the center, halfway between B and A. And that's what this means here. My expected value is halfway between B and A. And then my variance and my standard deviation, again, are fairly simple because of that. Now, again, unless the authors of this book, they don't think you have to do the uh, derivation, the mathematical derivation of where this divided by 12 goes or where, where it comes from, but just suffice it to say that for a uniform, prob uniform probability, this is the mathematical result that you're dividing by 12 the square of this to come up with the variance. Just like what we talked a couple of weeks ago on descriptive statistics, standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. So that, ha that hasn't changed. The unique thing here is the divide by 12. Again, that's specifically because of the shape of this distribution curve. So these would be the descriptive statistics that you would apply to a uniform distribution. So in this case, there is a light bulb that is going to last between 1,500 and 1,600 hours, and they're saying it's, it's a uniform distribution. It's just as likely to fail at 1,600 hours as at 1,500. It's just as likely to, to fail at 1,550. It, it, it shows no statistical likelihood of failing somewhere else. It's equally likely. Um, so the, the frequency at any given spot would be 1 100th. The B minus A is the 100th that's here in the denominator, and the likelihood of it failing is 1 divided by the range. Okay? So there's what it looks like graphically, and you're saying what is the probability that it's going to fail at 15.7, or you know, it's going to last until 15.70. So it's not going to fail between 1500 and 1570. It's going to fail between 1570 and 1600. So that is the 1570 to 1600 is 30. That's the difference there. So if there's 30 hours that it could fail, but it's not going to fail for these 70 hours. 30 out of the 100 hours available is when it's likely to fail. So instead, of, it's got a 100% likelihood of failing between 1,500 and 1,600. If you want to look at just this section of it, it's 31 hundredths of likelihood. Now, similarly, if, if I wanted to say, what's the likelihood that it's going to fail between 1,530 and 1,540? Now, I have 10 potential hours out of the 100. So the potential that it's going to file, file uh, fail, excuse me, fail between 1540, what did I say, 1530 and 1540 is 10%. The 
the likelihood it's going to fail between 1570 and 1600 is 30%. That make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you. So the expected value, again, these are the basic statistics, is that it's going to be halfway in between. On average, it would, it would end up being halfway. The variance, again, straightforward. Uh, I can pull this into Excel for you guys if you want to practice. Okay. Uh, so, again, this, you know, the standard deviation is just the square root of variance. The variance, take the 100, square it, divided by 12, that's where that is. So there's your descriptive statistics on what's the frequency of failure, or what's the expected life of that goal. So that's the uniform distribution. It, it, it's occasionally run into, but this normal, normal distribution is the key distribution that you run into in uh, the statistics world. Uh, and, and the main reason behind that is because most things can be modeled, and I say modeled, meaning that they're not necessarily 100% a normal distribution, but they can be modeled as a normal distribution. Uh, okay, so this is what the curve looks like. And compare this to what we were just talking about with the uniform distribution. The mean would be the center point of this curve. Okay, and then the standard deviation, I don't know why it doesn't show it on here. But the standard deviation, you would, you would calculate it using the same formula that we use for descriptive statistics and determine where one standard deviation is on this side of the mean and where one standard deviation is on this side. Well, just a note on nomenclature, again, this mu, the Greek letter mu, is defining that we're talking about the whole population. Well, this isn't a sample. We'll get into that later. If there's you know, 10 million units that you produced last year, uh, you're, you're sampling all 10 million of those, and you're saying, here's what the average of those was last year. So the whole population, same with the standard deviation, is the whole population, each individual reading, minus the mean, blah, 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 using the whole formula, gives you the standard deviation for the population. So that's what the normal distribution graph looks like. Uh, it doesn't go into the formula. I don't think of the PowerPoint. Yes, it does. So ignore this formula. It's, this is where it comes from. <laughs> don't pay any attention to that whatsoever. Let's see. Nothing. Okay, this is important. So, <laughs> so this is uh, what's called a standard normal curve, and the standard normal curve, uh, well. For any normal distribution, half of the values are on the left side of the Let me go back up here. This, you know, intuitively, this makes sense, but this is a balanced shape. It has the exact same shape on the right hand as it has on the left hand of mu. So half of the values, half of the values that you measure for that population will appear on the right side of your average. Half of these will appear on the left side. And obviously that's discounting the ones that actually will be exactly on the mean. But the point there is that the curve is symmetric and half are on either side of it. Um, again, I mentioned the standard deviation that, that isn't shown here on this curve. The standard deviation essentially pulls this shape. So I'm, I'm pulling the whole shape, but imagine that I'm just pulling one side of that shape. So I would be spreading the, this side that direction, and then I would be spreading this side this direction. Okay? I would be spreading both sides at the same time if I increased the standard deviation. The smaller that standard deviation is, the narrower and taller that curve becomes. The larger that standard deviation number is, the wider and shorter that term that, that, that curve becomes. Oh, I have another point. On a normal distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode are all at that same point. Now, again, that's a little misleading because if no number happens to be uh, repeated in your data set, then there would be no mode. But 
if there was a number repeated from the basic standard uh, normal distribution, it will be repeated and that's where it will be because an infinitesimally small point on either side of mu, uh, 100 decimal places to the left and 100 decimal places to the right, when you get right to mu, you're going to have a number repeated. That's going to be the only number that's repeated is right there at the center point, either side, plus or minus the decimal place. So, uh, this is where it comes from. Ignore that. So, for any given curve, for any given curve, this is on page uh, two or three of the books. Uh, the standard deviation will determine how much of the area underneath that curve uh, is being contained. So, if I have a Steve, you seem to be fading quite a bit. Can you hear me now? Can you, can you hear me just fine? Yeah, Steve, you sound fine. Okay. Yeah, you were just yeah, uh, kind of fading off a bit. Yeah, it's fading. Okay. Uh, I, I adjusted my mic when you said that, Steve, so am I sounding better now? Yes, you are. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it was... I mean, I only adjusted it half an inch, but apparently that's enough. Okay, so uh, on page 203, you can see what we're talking about here with these distributions. So if I have a vertical line on negative one standard deviation from the mu, from the center line, and I have a vertical line plus one standard deviation from the center line, what I've just done is I've created a bound for an area of that curve. So within that bound, I have captured 68.3% of the entire area underneath that whole normal curve. 68.3% of it is between plus and minus one sigma. Okay, so then the bottom curve on page 203, I've simply moved those two vertical lines from one sigma, plus or minus one sigma, and moved them outwards to plus or minus two sigma. And because of the shape of the curve, now that curve is getting closer and closer to the x-axis. Because of that shape, now at two sigma, I'm capturing 95 and a half percent. And then similarly, if I go out, continue, move those two lines out to the third standard deviation, uh, plus three sigma, minus three sigma, from that new position from the center, now I've captured 99.7% of the values of the total uh, measurements that are underneath that normal curve. Now, so for those of you, Chris, I'm sure you've heard it. I don't know, Rachel or Steve, if you've run into it in the industry. Have you heard the term Six Sigma? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. So that's where that Six Sigma comes from. If you're plus and minus three standard deviations, then you have a range of six standard deviations. So that six sigma is saying, I've got 99.7% of my values contro controlled. I know where 99.7% of them are within my standard deviation ranges. Okay. So that again, that's just a basic mathematical uh, fact of this ugly formula that I told you not to learn. That formula right there is where these three percentages come from. You don't have to memorize them. Uh, you can always look them up. You can always do a, a calculation in Excel to find out what that percentage is. Uh, but that's where they come from. These percentages are dictated by that formula. So one of the things I started to say earlier, a standard normal distribution they set that mean, the mu, at zero. Just define it to be zero. So half of the numbers are in the negative space and half of the numbers underneath that normal curve are in the positive space. And then they define that standard normal curve to have plus or minus one is the sigma. Sigma equals one. And again, what that's dictating is how wide that curve is and a ratio of how wide versus tall that standard normal curve is. So by definition, mu equals zero, sigma equals one. 
I've defined this exact basic shape. Again, that's an important basic shape for a lot of a lot of uh, just, uh, inferential statistics. So, yeah, it's going to become a, important for, for a lot of differential uh, inferential voice uh, uh, Inferi inferential statistics. Uh, so that that's an important thing to remember for a standard normal curve, as opposed to a normal curve. A standard normal curve is at zero and plus or minus one. So this is z-score. What you're doing is you're determining where you are on that curve. So which one did you square to pull up exercise? Normal distribution. What did we bring up standard? There it is, 204. So I am going to bring up something, but we're not going to jump onto this right away because we're doing it differently in Excel than we're doing it in the book. So let me skip seven more. Oh, wait, because I'm on the wrong chapter. We're in chapter six. It is the score of normal chapter. Uh, okay, so seven, six, I'm on the right one. I'm on the right one. Sorry, it's one. No, that's okay. Okay. So this. Exercise 6-1 that I popped up right here, this goes back to that uh, page 199. I'm not going to delve into it, but this was the uniform distribution. So looking at where the, uh, the expected values and the means of the uh, uniform distribution. So I mentioned that in case anybody has any questions about what we already went over. Uh, but otherwise, I'm not, if there was any unclarity on Uniform distribution to be found in the future piece. Okay, so then the next one, 6.2, is 6-2, is where we start talking about the normal distributions. So here is the way we're going to do it in Excel. I have to zoom in. This is the Excel formula, uh, and we'll get back to this in a minute. But this is the way you're going to calculate that expected value, the T value, uh, for the standard normal distribution. So the Z value is essentially your calculating where you are on that curve. So underneath that standard normal curve, like I was saying, if you're plus or minus uh, one sigma, you know you have 65% of it. I can calculate from any given spot on that curve where I am percentage-wise. If I'm at you know, 0.9, then how much of the curve lies to the left of me? If I'm at, because if I'm at, if I'm at one, I'm at plus one sigma, Sigma is one. So if I'm at plus one, I know I'm one sigma away from zero. But what if I'm at point nine? How much of that curve is below, is below me? Uh, so that's what the Z score is going to allow you to do. It's going to allow you to calculate percentages based on that. So this table is the standard way that statistics is taught students how to do this for centuries, or at least decades. Uh, so I want to mention this first and then tell you to forget about it because you'll do it with Excel. So what you do is you say, what Z value did I come up with? So this is this formula right here. What is my X value that I'm looking for? My mu is zero. My sigma is one. So essentially, I'm just saying on a standard normal, I'm just saying, what is my X value? I'm going to look it up. So if I want to know, 
in this case, what I had said was 0.9, but we'll say uh, 1.2. At 1.2, 88.5% of the curve is to the left of it. So uh, it would look like this. If I'm at 1.2, remember 1 is one standard deviation L. Minus 1 is minus 1 standard. I'm at 1.2, so I'm slightly more than one sigma. 88.5% of the curve is to the left. Conversely, that means 1 minus 0.8849, so about 0.11. About 11% of the curve is more than 1.2. About 88.5% of the curve is less than 1.2. This is the standard normal distribution, so by definition, I'm at zero. So, does that, does that make sense? What, this is one of the basic concepts, so I want to make sure that you guys understand it fully. Yeah. That wasn't very convincing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's do this again. For, so for this curve, I've defined, this is the standard normal curve, I've defined that mu, the average of the entire population, is zero. I've also defined for the standard normal curve that the standard deviation of that population is plus or minus one. So that will, that's what dictates how high versus wide this curve is. The width of this curve versus the height of this curve is dictated by that plus or minus one is my definition of sigma. So back to this right here, I know that between plus and minus one sigma, 68.3% of that curve is between those values. So, where was that? Oh, oh, we didn't have the graph for that. That was on page 203. Page 203 was where that showed 68.3% of that curve is, bet is between those values. So, what I'm doing is essentially I'm Taking, see on, on page two or three, there's two lines there. Now, when I look at this curve right here, essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking one of those curves, one of those lines, excuse me, out. And I'm just saying, well, from this spot, how much total is area? How much total area underneath that curve is to the left of it? 88.5% of that whole curve is to the left of it. Okay. And in this case, it's 88.5% to the left of. 1.2. So this is just the z value that I came up with. Again, the z value is what x do I want to know minus mu, well in this case mu is 0, divided by sigma. In the case of the standard normal curve, sigma is 1. So essentially I'm saying for any value x, I can calculate what percentage of the curve I'm, I'm partitioned with that with that value of x. Does that make a little more sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so again, that's one of those basic ideas, and, and it's somewhat not very useful because we're talking about a mu of zero. We'll extrapolate from that or expand upon that and say it's for any normal distribution, the exact same uh, concept applies. Uh, so if we go, close this one. This is the standard normal for one. Well, it goes along with six thousand two. So if we go to here, here I have a standard normal distribution, and I want to know the probability or the percentage of values that are between zero and two point eight. So just like on this curve right here, I wanted to know everything that was greater than negative infinity at 1.2. In the case of this Excel, <laughs> so in the case of Excel, it's saying, or in the Excel example, excuse me, it's saying, instead of going from negative infinity, go from zero. Z, any value Z, is greater than or equal to zero, and less than or equal to 2.18. So similar to on page 203, 
in this graph, what I would be doing is I would be putting a line here at zero and another line out here at 2.38, saying how much of the area of that curve is between those points. Okay, so that's what's happening here in, in exercise 2.6.2 uh, on page 205. So the way you do that in Excel looks like instead of looking it up on that table, I'm going to show you a few minutes ago, you do this formula, the normal S. So the normal and S would be standard and the distribution. Okay. And so what I'm doing is I'm saying, I want to know all the area that's to the left of 2.8. And then I want to know all the area that's to the left of zero. And because I want to know the difference between them, I'm going to ignore, I'm going to reduce, I'm going to deduct all of the area to the left of zero, because I only want to know the area between 2.1. So let me, let me do this, take off this section. 98.5% of the area underneath that curve is to the left of 2.1. But we know that at zero, 50% of it is to the left of zero. So I can just say minus 0.5, because I don't want to know anything that's to the left of zero. I want to know greater than or equal to zero. Okay, does that make sense? threw away everything to the left hand of zero. So I took everything to the left of 2.18, and I threw everything to the left of zero. So I go back to the formula. What I've done is I've done it in two pieces. There's everything to the left of 2.18 minus everything to the, to the left of zero. That gives me the area between those two vertical lines, just like on page 208 with my plus or minus one six just put my vertical lines in two different spots and I said what's the area between I could do one okay so if I change what's this probability that it's greater than or equal to one and What's the probability that is greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 2.18? And in my formula, I say everything to the left of 2.18, subtract everything to the left of 1, and that would give me the area underneath the curve between 1, plus 1, and plus 2.18. Okay? So let's undo those put them back to where they were. In this case, I want to know everything to the right of the Z would be greater than 1.54, negative 1.54, and to the left of U. So I'm going to do, I want to know everything to the left of zero, and I'm going to subtract everything to the left of negative 1.54. So again, I, I wish I had good curve, curves to show you where those vertical lines would be, but just picture the, the the graph on page 203 and I'm essentially I'm just moving those vertical lines to negative 1.54 would be the left hand vertical line and zero would be the right hand vertical line and I'm saying how much is how much area what's the percentage of it that's between those two vertical lines it's 43 and a half percent okay exact same thing here on uh, part C Everything to the left of 1.75, subtract everything to the left of minus 1.5. Okay? So that is what's happening on uh, exercise 6.2 on page 205. So that all was done with calculating a percentage from a value. So I've given a value, 1.2, and I've said, what's the percentage less than 1.2? It's 88.5%. What if I wanted to say, I want to know that 75% of my, of my items are going to be less than what value? 
I'm going to dictate the percentage 75% and say what value would that be? 75% of my items that I measure are going to be less than such and such. So uh, I can use this, this exact same concept two different ways. Given a, a data value, I can calculate the percentage, which is the probability that that is going to occur, um, versus given a probability, find out what the actual x value would be. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So for this example here, which isn't from the book, uh, uh, it doesn't say what company, what kind of company Kronos is. So you've got a company that's an online company that somebody comes in and submits a, a request. Kronos says, well, we handle all of our requests within eight minutes and the standard deviation of 1.25. So we want to know, management at Kronos wants to know the probability that the customer will have to wait more than nine minutes. Okay, so we've got eight minutes and we've got 1.25 minutes. Um, and I think that this has left something important out. Um, that's a standard normal period. Don't say that. Uh, let me flip through the book because they transition from So on page 206, it says calculating z-scores for any normal distribution. So, so the important thing that, that was taken there is that here, what I've done is I've changed from looking at a standard normal, where I know mu equals zero, and I know sigma equals one, and I'm just saying any normal table. So it doesn't have to be centered on zero. I can take any value. So in this case, Kronos is centered on 8. And instead of having a standard deviation of 1, like the standard normal does, this one has a standard deviation of 1.5. So the exact same process will work. My z-score calculation, remember before on my standard, my z-score was, was x minus mu over sigma. For a standard, it was just z equals x. Now, for Kronos, I've got an x value of 9, and I've got a mu of 8, and I've got a sigma of 1.25. So I can still calculate my z value the exact same way, even for a non-standard normal. It's still a normal distribution. We've defined it as a normal distribution, but it's not a standard one. So here's my x value. Here is my uh, mu, and here is my sigma. So then I just do the calculations. My z value is 0.8. So 80% of the curve is going to be to the left of me. Now, I can go to the standard normal table and find the value that's closest to uh, 0.8. Let's see. Let me find that. It's not on this section of the table. This is just a portion of the table. Uh, So the back of the book has the full table. You could go to that full table and find 0.788 being the closest value to 0.8. Um, and so you would say 78% of the time, customers are going to wait less than nine minutes. But that means 21% of the time, they're going to be waiting more than nine minutes. So you know you were pretty proud about that eight minutes, but more than one out of every five customers has to wait more than nine minutes. Okay? Crap. <laughs> I know. What are you burning an extra minute like that? What's up with that? Um, oh, here's here's the other section of that table. So, <laughs> so see what we did was we found the z value. There's the 0.8. So we go to find the 0.8 on the z table, and the percentage that's underneath that curve is shown. It's the percentage to the left of 0.8. So there's 0.8, and we want to see to the left of it. 78% of that curve is to the left of it, okay? Um, so, although average waiting time is only eight minutes, 
there's a 5% probability that a customer will have to wait how many minutes. So this is flipping that around. Instead of giving me a value and saying, what's the percentage? This is flipping it around and saying, given this percentage, what's the value? How long do the worst 5% of the wait times take? So what we're looking for is 95% of them, 1 minus 0.05, 100% of the customers have a wait, whether it's zero minutes or 1,000. 100% of them have a wait. 95% of them are going to be to the left of what I'm interested in. So I can look up the Z value for 95% and find out um, what that magic number is, how long 5% away. So if I go to the Z table um, and I look for 95%, remember I'm, I'm, I'm given the percentage. In every other case, I was looking for the number. So I would I put the number in and then I looked over for the percentage. In this case, it's the opposite. In this case, it was the opposite. So I look for a value of 95%, which it, there isn't. So I'm looking between those two. And then what would be the number? 1.645. Okay, 1.645 is the value that that Z right there would be, 1.645. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm adding that many minutes to my mu. So here was my mu of eight. I'm adding 1.65 standard deviations. Remember, this is in, um, this Z is standard deviations. If we go back to our basic definition of a standard uh, normal curve, one standard deviation, Z of one, would be one uh, unit away. In this case, I'm 1.65 standard deviations away. Standard deviation in our problem was 1.25, and so I'm 1.65 of those away from my center point. So this means that 5% of my customers have to wait more than 10 minutes to get helped, even though on average it's only eight minutes. You follow that? Yeah. I can do it again. I can do it again if, if there's uh, unclarity. Is that 1.65 multiplied by 1.25? Yes. So okay. this is the number of standard deviations, and this is the standard deviation. So I'm saying 1.65 of these, so 1.65 times this, and I'm adding it to mu, that's what my x value is. Gotcha. That's, the, that's this value. If, so what I've done is this is a, a normal curve with a mean of zero. Well, my mean is really eight. Okay, this is a normal curve where I'm looking at how many standard deviations above the mean. Well, it's 1.65 standard deviation. So when I take this out of the standard curve and I'm looking at it as the actual curve of the of the wait time, this would say eight minutes, and this right here would say 10.06 minutes is how long that wait would be. 5% um, of my customers would wait at least 10.06 minutes. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, Again, I've already shown the, the sorry, I'm going to cough again. Okay, sorry. Um, so I've already shown the standard distribution in Excel. Let me zoom in again. What I've done here is this is no longer a standard distribution because it's no longer centered on zero. My distribution is now centered on 120, and my distribution no longer has a mean, or excuse me, a standard deviation of one. The standard deviation is now 10. But I want to find out exactly the same thing: the area underneath the curve between this line and this line, except it's not standard anymore. So it's the exact same formula, exact same process, except I no longer have the point S in there. And then what I have here, and this is where bring up our handy dandy little help function. So remember how I did this, I click on the function uh, symbol 
icon here pops up the, the function. Because there's already a function in this cell, it pops up the function. If I click in an empty cell and I click on the same icon, it pops up the insert function dialog box. Because there already is a function in this box, when I click on the icon, it brings up that function's arguments. Then I can click help on that function, it will bring up the help on normal distribution. So in this case, here's the X, I want to know for 112. Here's the mean, well my mean is 120, which in my case here you see, you see in this uh, formula bar, B2 is where I, the value for mean is. So the cell address B2 is where my mean is. My standard deviation is the next factor in my, in my function, and that's in cell B3, so B3 here is 10, that's my standard deviation. And do I want this to be cumulative? Cumulative means that it's going to continue to add to that percentage of area on the curve as I move from negative infinity towards the right. So that's exactly what we've been doing all along. Uh, so we're going to continue to do that. So that is what that function right there is doing for me. So I'm saying I want to know everything to the left of 120, and then I'm going to subtract everything to the left of 112 to get the percentage that's between those. Same exact thing as we were talking about on the standard normal, except we've just, we're using a slightly different uh, Excel function. Any questions on that? Mm -mm. To, me, to me, when I was doing this, this is uh, one of the complicated uh, aspects of it. Trying to, to bear in mind this idea and especially when you start to subtract one area from another area, uh, like on the bottom of page 207, where you're finding the area between the vertical lines. Uh, to me, that's one of the more challenging things. But everybody's clear on that. Okay, so the one thing to add to this, and let me see where we are in the book, 6.3. Is the one that we're on. So the one thing to add to this. So <clears throat> here I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm saying everything to the left of 135 minus everything to the left of 120. Exact same thing here. Exact same thing here. This one is an oddball. See here I'm saying I want to I want to find everything greater than 105. So what I've done here is a hundred percent of my curve is somewhere. And since I'm trying to find greater than, the normal function of this normal operation of this Excel function is that it's going to show me the area to the left of a number. So to find out the area to the right of the number, I have to subtract it from one. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, give me the, the uh, portion of the area to the left of 105 and subtract subtract that from one. So let me do this. Six percent, six point six eight percent of the values are to the left of one oh five. Now without changing anything, all I all I'm doing is instead of looking left and looking at that point oh six, I'm going to turn right and I say, okay, so if point oh six of it is on my left, how much of it is on my right? Well the rest of it is on my right. So one minus what's on my left is the rest of it. So that's what this one minus is saying. It's saying the rest of it is on the right side. How much is greater than? Well, it's the remainder. Okay? So one minus what's on the left gives me what's on the right. Okay, questions? No. Nearly. Nearly through with chapter six. Uh, beat that up, beat that up. Okay, this is the Kronos ex example again shown in Excel. So it would be, what's the probability that you waited for more than nine minutes? Well, it's one minus the probability that you waited less than nine minutes. So the area to the left of nine is 78%. And if we go back to here, oh wait, no, no, no. 
area to the left was 0.788. So here, the area to the left was 0.788, and I want to turn around and look to the opposite side. So one minus that shows me 21% are waiting longer than nine minutes. If I want to know which, what's uh, the highest 5%, you know, this one is a cool one we haven't really talked about. This is doing the inverse. So if I want to know a percentage giving a value, I use the distribution. If I want to know a value given a percentage, I use the inverse of the normal distribution function in Excel. Okay? So the distribution function gives me a value from a percentage. The inverse gives me, uh, I just said that right. The distribution gives me a percentage from a value. There's 21%. The inverse gives me a value from a percentage. So I want to know 95% are going to be less than 10. This normal dot inverse gives me a value from that percentage, again, given this meaning of the standard deviation. Clear? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, and then that's it. Exponential distribution we're not covering, although it's really kind of cool. I don't know why we don't want to. Uh, that's it. We're going to chapter six. Only 55 minutes. Chapter seven's a lot. Do it faster. Whoa. Okay, chapter seven, like I said, we're done with uh, descriptive statistics, and we're going to start on infer inferential statistics. So what that means is, um, can I determine something about a larger population? Remember, when we were just talking about these curves, the normal curves, we were saying for the population, mu is whatever, it was eight for chronos.com. Um, but that was for every single one. We measured every single one in the entire population, and the average of all of those together was you. Well, if we don't have every single one, for whatever reason we can't measure the statistics on it, uh, then I have to do a sample, and then I have to use the information that I need from that sample to infer information about the entire population. Okay? So, a few things we'll talk about is the type of sampling that you can do, and I'm not going to keep this up. I'm going to zip through this. There's different ways that you can determine what to sample, how often to sample, how random are you really being, etc. And the whole concern is that you want your sample to be representative of your population. So, uh, you know, they uh, every time that there's going to be an election, they, they always do these polls. And so they'll, they'll, let's say, for example, I'm not saying that this is the way all the poll takers do it, but let's say, for example, they stand outside the uh, Horsehead Bar at 3 a.m. on a Friday night and <laughs> Ask the patrons as they're exiting, having been kicked out because last call has hit. That's not safe. It's not safe, and it also probably isn't a very representative sample of the full electorate. Does that make sense? Uh, and this horse head bars not safe. In general, whether it's three o'clock on a Friday night or not. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. <laughs> but you see my point. The point is that it's not a very representative sample. What was that, Steve? Especially if you're only arming yourself with a clipboard. <laughs> Those things are dangerous. Uh, okay, so, but you see my, my overworked point, which is that's not a very representative sample. So when you're doing sampling for statistics, if you're going to actually have a valid inference, it has to be representative of the entire population. That doesn't mean that it's equal to the entire population, just that it's representative. That means any 
particular, uh, again, let's use our voting example. Any particular voter has the same likelihood of getting drawn with each time I take the sample. So maybe that means if I want to get the people that go to the bars and the people that go to the churches, then I have to understand, well, I might need to take 10, uh, this is the city of Eugene, I might need to take 10 people's samples as they're exiting church on Sunday morning and 30 people's samples as they're exiting the bar Friday night because of the ratio of the people that go to church and the people who don't go to church in the city of Eugene. And then I have a relatively representative sample. Okay, so that's enough of me up on sample. Uh, why sample? Yeah, I think that that's a pretty clear. Unless you guys have some questions. Uh, choosing a sample size. Okay, so here's the deal with sample size. Well, first of all, again, in small is the quantity, the number. In your sample, cap in is the number in your population. So here's the quick and dirty thing on sample size. That's what your sample size is. Okay. Wow, you're cutting out bad. Am I? Again? Yeah. Okay, I just I just uh, arranged my mind. How am I doing now? Better. Okay. I don't. I, I don't actually know if it actually is my mic or if I just happen to get internet dropping out right then. Okay. Um, okay. So let me know again if if you can't hear me. So the the deal with sample size. The easy answer for sample size is thirty. If you want it to be a robust sample, then you should have thirty out of a population of at least six hundred. You never want your sample size to be larger than 5% of your population. Or excuse me, uh, no, you can have it larger than population. You don't want to have, ever have a population of less than 600, and you never want to have a, a sample size of less than 30. If you're just doing inferential statistics, that's kind of your, your uh, gold standards. 600 population. 30 sample size. Anything above that, you're gold. Anything below that, then you start to have uh, individual samples have a, have a uh, oversized impact on your statistics if you have too few samples. If you happen to have an outlier in that sample, it has an, a too large impact on your statistics. So that's the, that's the thing with sample sizes. Uh, random sampling. Yes, we want it to be random. Uh, there's a couple of alternative, again, that's stratified sampling. That's the idea of standing outside of the horse head and, and outside of the Nazarene church. Uh, so the example here is for, the, and I'll bring this up, let's see, chapter seven is where we are now. I can't believe nobody else showed up tonight. What's up with you guys? Oh, wait, I can't call you guys out because you're here. Do we need any credit? <laughs> you guys will absolutely do better on the homework and the quizzes, I promise you. Do we get extra credit? Well, that's what I'm saying. You'll oh get more points. <laughs> <laughs> He's that's, kind that's, of a, it's okay. that's, that's, a, that's a legitimate question. <laughs> it is. And, I, and I'm almost positive that my answer is still yes. So let, let's, do, let's, let's, let's break the, this class size down into probabilities and uh, stuff. Um, yeah. And what's the probability that we're going to get a better grade? Than the probability <laughs> that, that you guys will get a better grade on this week's homework is um, high. <laughs> <laughs> is, there a, is, there a, is there a function for high? Yes, it's um, <laughs> cap sub Q. <laughs> so actually, I want to ask something. I can't remember. Somebody sent me an email. Um, I can't remember who it was. That the recording worked out well when when the when the uh, session ended last time, WebEx should have automatically sent you guys an email that said, "Oh, your recording of your session is available here." Did any of you guys go out and view it, and did the recording work well? well I did. I did I, not. Yeah, I was online, so I, I didn't, but I should have. Well, it, it, it's okay. I'm, 
it's not like you're in trouble because you did it, so don't say you should have, but I'm just curious how, how that worked out. Somebody had emailed me and said it was it was beneficial for them, and I just wanted to get a larger sample. Okay, so this um, demonstration 7.1 I think is kind of silly. The important thing about that one is the idea of the combinations. If you remember those ugly formulas for combinations and permutations, that's the only thing that's real relevant here. When you're taking a sample uh, from a population, essentially what you're doing is you're doing a combination from that you know, infactorial, I'm on page 235, from that infactorial over blah, blah, blah. That's what you're doing with the sample size versus the population size. You're saying how many different relevant samples would I potentially be drawn from that sample or from that population, excuse me. So that's what's happening here at High Plains is I have a population of a thousand and I'm going to, and that's the freshman class, so you know, that's pretty good size school. Um, so I got a thousand in the freshman class and I'm going to take a sample to see how much they study on a weekly average. So I can do it three ways. I can, instead of doing a sample, ask every single one of the thousand and actually come up with a population mean and a population standard deviation. Okay. Take a while, uh, probably by the time I got to person number 1,000, the uh, statistics for person number one would have changed. It would have changed their mind about how many hours they actually studied. So uh, there, that's alternative one is sample everything. The second one is to sample, let's use 40 as our number. So again, remember 630 was kind of my gold standard. I'm at 1,000 for my population, and I'm at 40 for my sample size. So I'm golden there. So I chose 40. What 40 students am I going to take? So the example in the book on page 234 is to use this random number table. Again, just like the Z table that we were looking at in Chapter 6, that's the old way, not the Z table, but the, yeah, this is the Z table. That's the old standard that they've used for decades. The new way is you use Excel. So instead of looking at alternative two, we're going to look at um, alternative three. So here, and I'm going to bring up this and we'll do this together. So I'm just going to open up a new tab here and I'm going to say we've got a thousand students. Now I'm going to put in student number one here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit F5. And that brings up the go-to. I'm going to say I want to go to A1000. And then I'm going to put in a number there. That's just going to give me an anchor. So now I'm going to go up to here and I'm going to say A2 is equal to A1 plus 1. And then I'm going to copy that formula down to my anchor that I put at A1000. So what I've just done is I've numbered off the students. So there's number 176. There's number 1000. Okay. Now, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to say that there's a random number between, uh, okay, so Steve, how, how long do you study per week? Not enough. <laughs> That's not a number. Uh, let's, say, uh, let's say a good two hours a day, so 14 hours a week. 14 hours a week. Okay, Rachel, how about you? Oh God, we're saying eight hours. Oh, okay. So I'm going to come well, up with for the class. You mean? Well, for you're taking two classes right now. How much do you study per week? Sixteen. Okay. So Steve, you said fourteen, and Rachel, you said sixteen. So that doesn't give us a very broad range, but it'll work perfectly fine. So I'm going to come up with a random number between fourteen and sixteen. Now I'm going to hit F5 again, and I'm going to say go to B1000 and put in an anchor there. And I'm going to copy that random number generator from uh, B1 to B1000. Okay, so 14, 15, 16 are the, are the three values that I've got. Now I'm going to convert those formulas. So again, I'm going fast, so stop me if you have questions. I'm going to hold down the, sh I'm at B1, hold down the shift button, push the end button and the down arrow, and I just highlighted everything. And now I'm going to hit Control C. Actually, I'll do it up here. Copy. And now I'm going to say paste as uh, values, how do I do this? Tell, oh, there it is, paste values. 
So what I'm doing is I'm turning those formulas, actually, before I do this. See, right now there's a formula in that Excel, equals random between 14 and 16. I'm going to copy that and say paste as values. So what I just did is I turned those formulas into numbers. Okay, so now I have a thousand students that have given me, um, or, or a thousand students that are studying, and this is the number of hours that they are, that they are studying. I haven't done the um, the survey yet. This is just what's happening in the background with the population. Now I want to survey them. How am I going to select my 40 samples? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing, except now I'm just going to say equals random. So random is any value between 0 and 1. Okay, So I'm going to say equals random, and there's a value that's between 0 and 1. Now I'm going to hit F5 again and go to C1000, put in an anchor, go back up to C1, copy that down to an anchor. Okay, Now I've got random numbers assigned. Now again, the problem with this is every time that you do anything in Excel, if I if I came over here, so right now I got seven three four seven one seven. If I type high right here in D, it's going to recalculate the spreadsheet. So watch C1, it just changed. See that? So I'm going to copy and paste special values. And now I've just locked this in. Is that your head hurting? No, that was my dog. <laughs> okay, so now comes the fun part. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select that whole thing, and I'm going to say, I'm going to go up here and say data, sort, and it's going to say, hey, wait, look, there's other stuff beside it. Do you really want me to sort just column C, or do you want me to sort the adjacent rows as well? And I say, yes, I want you to sort the adjacent rows. So now it's it automatically highlighted column A and column B, and I say, I want to sort on column C from smallest to largest. Okay. Oh, man. I forgot to change these. See, these are all formulas right now. These need to get changed to values also. Okay. So, so I'm going to say all data sort, expand the selection, sort on column C, C, smallest to largest. Okay. Now, what I've done is I've randomly selected the lowest 40 of those random values. So I assigned a, a random formula to cell C, or to column C, excuse me, and then I sorted on column C from smallest to largest. So these 40 students, see how it's not, you know, student one, student seven, student nine, there's no, there's no, uh, what's the word I want? Uh, uh, repeatability. It's completely random. Uh, so that's how I would select the 40 students that I want to go. Here's student ID number 271. How many hours do you study? So then I take that and I say those 40 students, see down here at the bottom of my Excel, average 15.225. So my random sampling of 40 students average 15.225 Compared to the population, the population average is 15.04. So when I randomly selected 40 students, I happen to select some that are a little more studious than average by two tenths of an hour a week. But what I've done is I've said this 40 students sample is representative of what I expect the entire population. So you can see there, even though my mean which we're going to call X bar, even though my X bar for my sample is different than my mu for my population, 15.225 for my sample versus 15.04 for my population, they're similar. They're roughly representative. My sample is roughly representative of uh, the entire population. Does that make sense? Rachel muted, so you guys have to answer now. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. So I beat that to snot. That's what this random number generator does. Um, random between, covered all of that. Blah, blah. Okay. So one interesting little side note is when you're doing a sample, you can either take that sample out 
and put it back in, in which case every single time that you make their sample, you have the probability, potential, of selecting that exact same sample again. Now the problem with it is, let's say that you have a population of 1,000, and you're going to do a sample of 100 of those. You pick out an object, let's call it object A. You sample it, and then you put object A back in, and you select another sample out of that bin, and you, you mix it up, blah, 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 you reach in and grab again, and you happen to grab sample A again. There's a thousand items in there. You have a one in 1,000 chance every single time of selecting sample A. Put it back in the second time, mix them up, grab again, pull out your third sample, and look at sample A. In theory, it's potentially possible to randomly select sample A 1,000 times, no, excuse me, 100 times, and you say, hey, I took 100 samples, but you really only sampled one, okay? So that's the idea That's of, of sampling with replacement or without replacement. I don't want to measure that same exact thing twice. So when I pull it out of the bin the first time, I measure it, I put it into a different bin so that when I take my second sample out, I'm not going to be repeating my measurement. Okay, that's what this with or without replacement is. Um, okay, next topic, confidence intervals. So when I said that my average for those 40 samples was 15.225, what I'm really interested in is how confident am I that the 15.225 is exactly the same as the population. I'm not real confident that the population mean is exactly the same as my sample mean. But if I said, well, this is what my sample mean is, 15.25, I think my population mean is probably, therefore, between 15 and 15 and a half. Okay. Now I can say, how confident am I that that range captures the average of my population? So I can statistically calculate that, uh, and that's called the confidence interval. How confident am I that that includes my, my uh, range? So the point estimation is the 15.225, but I don't want a point estimation. I want an interval. So it's 15.225 plus or minus some amount, and I want to know, does that confidence interval contain the actual population average? Because that's really what my point is. I couldn't care less what my sample is, I'm using the sample to try to infer what the entire population is. So, sampling distribution, this is again a critical item in statistics in general, and especially in the second half, you know, we're in the second half now of the two topics for this class. First is descriptive, Second is inferential. That's the two large classes of information, and now we're in the second half. So probably the most important item in the entire second half of this class is this idea of distribution. So when I take a sample, there's a distribution associated with it. Just like when I measured, you know, there was 10 that measured 4. There was 11 that measured 5. Okay. I made a distribution of the number of each of those items. Well, now what I'm doing is I'm doing a distribution of the samples. So the sampling distribution gives me a mean. The sampling distribution gives me a standard deviation of the samples. And the question is, how does that relate to the population? Uh, OK, so I'll keep that up. So this is, uh, this is example 7. Dot 7.2 on page 238. Uh, so they're saying that you've got four major accounts, and this is the total amount that they bill each year. So if I took a sample, I could say, I want to see a sample of A, account A, and a sample of account B, and together the average of those two, I can highlight that, but the average of 20 and 40, is 30. That's where this comes from. So the average of my samples is 30. If I randomly took samples that were A and C, then the average of 20 and 40 in that case is 30. So 
the point is I've got six different samples that I could pull, and this would be the average of my samples. Well, in this case, what, what I have here is a uniform distribution. I have equal likelihood of pulling any one of those. So that uniform distribution looks like this, but look again here at my sampling numbers. I've got one at 20, four at 30, and one at 40. So if I plotted my actual population, it's a uniform distribution. But if I plot my sample, there's one at 20, four at 30, and one at 40, it looks like this. Well, this shape is clearly not the same as the uniform distribution of population. This shape looks kind of like a normal curve. Okay, so this is another really important concept. Uh, for a large sample size, the sampling distribution for my sample, the average of my sample, is going to be the same as the average for my population. The standard deviation of the sample is simply going to be the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So, and again, this is, remember I mentioned 30 to you. This is when your sample size is, excuse me, greater than 30. So this is based on, again, a, be thankful the authors did think it was worth your while, and I agree with them. It's not worth your while to try to derive all of this, but the central limit theorem is where this comes from that your sample is going to look like, okay, let's go back to here, a bell curve. See that sample right there? It looks like this. The more samples that I grab, the more it looks like a bell curve. Central limit theorem is where that idea comes from. The view of my population is going to be the X bar of my sample, but my sample is going to be a bell shape, regardless of the shape of my population. And the more samples that I draw from my mean, the more it looks like a bell curve. Okay. Central limit theorem, the, ignore all the rest. Of the, the important part of this is you can assume that a population, uh, excuse me, that a sample is going to have a bell curve shape regardless of the uh, shape of the population sample. If you have a uh, sample size that's greater than or equal to 30. Okay? If you have a sample size that's less than 30, if your population shape was normal, well then your sample will be normal also. But if your population isn't normal and you have a sample of greater than or equal to 30, your sample will be normal. The value to that is the tools that we just talked about in the last chapter with normal curves will apply to your samples. Now I can use those exact same tools to do inferential statistics with. Okay, One of the things that happens here is the more samples that I draw, 9, 8, 20, the more samples that I draw, the less deviation, the less uh, standard deviation I have on my, uh, on my curve of my samples. And what that means is the better my approximation of the sample to my population is. Because remember, the point of that sample is I'm trying to say that based on this sample, I can conclude the average of the population is the law. Okay. The more samples that I draw, the better my sample average is at predicting my population average. So uh, there's some, I think it's in the book. There was some statement in the book, and I can't remember what it said, about uh, the law of large numbers. There it is on page 242. The law of large numbers is the, the larger my sample size, the, the stronger my correlation is, meaning the better my inference is about my population from my sample. Okay. The expected value of my, my sample, I already told you that from the central limit theorem, the expected average of my sample is u. However, the standard error, the standard deviation, which this is the standard error of my x bar, of my average of my sample, is the standard deviation of the population over the square root of the number of my sample. 
Okay, so this is an ugly little thing. Don't be too concerned about it because Excel is going to do your work. But this concept is important. The sigma over the square root of n is what your standard error is in your sample. So calculated this sample. Is it good at predicting where the average of my population is? Well, sure, with an error. What is the size of my error? Here is the size of my error. So remember, the sigma of my population is describing how wide that curve is. If my population is a really wide sigma, then um, it's a lot harder to hit where that mu is. Um, so anyway, that's where this standard error comes from on my sample. I also mentioned the, the 600 and the 30. This is where that 600 came from was from this right here. If the sample size is a large fraction of the population size, then you have to have this correction factor. So if you if your sample size is larger than 5% of your population, so let's say you took your 30 samples, but your population was only 300, now your sample size is 10% of your population. You have a finite population, and so you have to do this correction factor, this, this right here. Okay. We're going to ignore that because we're just going to treat everything as if it was a properly sized sample. But this is just a side note about the importance of that 600 and the 30 is, is so that you don't have to deal with this correction. How are we doing? Are everybody hanging in there? We're 30 slides away. Yep. OK, thank hey, you. <laughs> OK, so what this interval means is, OK, remember we talked about the z-score. What we're saying here is how many standard errors away is my, how many standard errors is my range of my sample mean? So what I'm asking there is how, this is that confidence interval. How well does my sample mean confidence interval capture the, um, the actual average of my population? So. Again, I, w I wish there was more content to explain where this comes from, and since there really isn't an explanation, then it's one of those things you have to remember, and then when you see it, you're like, oh, I can't remember that. Well, so to identify this Z value right here, you're taking one minus the confidence level divided by two. It's just, you've got to remember that. So when I tell you I want to know 95, with 95% 95 assurity that uh, my sample average is going to capture my population average, then you would say 1 minus 95% divided by 2, so that would be 0 0.025. So this gives you the z value. So you're going to say 0 0.025 times the standard deviation divided by uh, the, the number in my sample, and I'm going to add that to x, and that would be the upper bound of my confidence level. And then I'm going to subtract that from x and that from x bar, excuse me. And that would be the lower bound of my confidence level. So now what I've just essentially done, and I think, yes, there it is. What I've essentially done is I put this line here and this line here, and I'm saying between those two values is where I is where my sample is predicting that my population average is going to be located. Uh, so, if I took in this in this example, let me just zoom in on this a little bit. Okay, so if I took on this uh, sample right here, so here's my population is is shown underneath this curve, and the population real true mu is located there, but I don't know what the mu is. So I've taken samples of the population. I've taken five distinct samples of the population with the intention of using those samples to predict what the view of the population is. This sample right here, I took the sample and I developed confidence limits. This sample right here, I took the view and I developed confidence limits, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see what happened there. Three of my samples did indeed capture the view of the population. Two of my samples did not. Okay? 
that's an important thing to realize when I'm designing. Uh, when I'm designing uh, this statistical test, I want to have a high likelihood that my sample is going to accurately predict my population. Otherwise, why am I wasting my time? So, what I do here is I say I want it to be plus or minus one standard deviation. So, 68.3% of my samples will contain the population mean. Or, if I say plus or minus two, see, now look at the width around this sample and compare it to the previous one. See how much narrower this one is? This one isn't giving me as much latitude on my measurement to make sure that I capture uh, that view. This one here, again, see X5 still didn't get to the view, but 95.5% of my samples would accurately um, contain mu. So if I said the average of X1 is 1.2, then I can use this sample to say, yes, I can accurately predict my population. You know, kind of beating this up, but this is one of the key ideas of inferential statistics, using a sample to accurately predict a, um, a population. Okay, and then you know, plus or minus three, these are the same percentages we talked about in the standard normal code. Sampling error is the difference between what your X bar is. Okay, so let's go back to here. Well, the difference between X bar here and mu here. That X bar minus mu, that's my sampling error. Okay. And again, it's absolute value. It doesn't matter whether it's on the left or the right. It's the value. How far are we away from it? The margin of error is slightly different than the standard error. But the margin of error is, is Remember this right here, this is in standard deviations. So I'm a certain number of standard deviations away. Well, my margin of error, what I do is I multiply that standard number of standard deviations by sigma. And that gives me the actual, actual uh, margin of error. So here's my X bar. My margin of error is how many, how many standard errors away am I? Does that make sense? It's mm -hmm. just a nomenclature kind of thing, but that's the difference between standard error and margin. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I wish that I got paid seventy-eight thousand dollars like these physicians do, but you know I didn't have to go to school as long as they did. A recent study by the AMA focused on blah. So they they took a sample of two hundred new uh, PCs and they, the average of the sample was 78,400. Now the AMA says, I want to know with 95% confidence level what, what the estimate for the population is there, okay? Now again, here they're assuming that the, that the standard deviation of the population, every primary care physician in the United States of America, the standard deviation is 5,500. Uh, so given this standard deviation, oops, this standard deviation, and given this sample mean, I want to know with 95% confidence what the mean, what the range, the confidence limits for the entire population is. So my n is 200, my sigma for my population is 5,500, so my standard error is 388. My margin of error is how many Z's am I away from my mu, okay? So how many Z's am I? I want a 95% probability. Well, that's the one, uh, where did he get that 764? 762. Um, oh, he's he's getting ahead of himself. Okay, so this 1.96. Let me see. He doesn't really explain that, does he? The 1.96 comes from the one minus. Remember, I told you that 
we're just going to have to remember this one here. One minus the confidence level divided by two. That's where the Z came from. So that's the 0 0.025. And then you look that up on the Z table. And the value for that 0 0.025 is where this 1.96. I don't know why he doesn't show this in this sample. Am I missing something in this example? Slide 50, slide 51. He doesn't explain anywhere where that 1.96 comes from, does he? This is where it comes from. The 0 0.025 is the 1 minus 0 0.95 divided by 2. And you look up 0 0.025 on your Z table, and the value for that is 1.96. So you're 1.96 sigmas away from U. So you take that 1.96 times your sigmas. Well, we calculated the sigma, the standard error there. So your margin of error is 1.96 times your standard error, so plus or minus $762. So I'm going to take the average of my sample, 78,400, add 76, 762, and subtract 762. So I can say with 95% confidence that the average of my population, U, is going to be between that number and that number. Okay, so uh, another example of this, back to the polls, is that they can say, you know, uh, a 3% error in the sample. Well, they use this exact same kind of thing to come up with that 3% error. They look at the number in the sample, they look at the standard deviation of the sample, et cetera, and that's where they come up with a range, okay, is by, is by the determination of, based on that 5% error, I have this range. That makes sense. I wish I wish that the explanation for this was here in black and white for you, um, or we could do it in Excel. Let's go close this. Let's see. Because I think I'm at seven point three. Let's see. Uh, I did that one. Close that. Seven point three. Seven point three doesn't help us. We'll pass seven point three. I thought that one of these example problems. There it is. Seven point four. So this this z value right here, this one point nine six that we were just talking about. So in this this is uh, page two forty eight is where sample. Um, whereas we're exercise 7.4 is located. So we have a sample size of 60. We have a sample mean of 97. Of those 60 samples, the average was 97. We have received a, a population standard deviation of 22, and we want to know with 95% confidence what the mean of the population would be. So 1 minus that gives me the 0.05. Now, the way you do it in Excel is you say it's a, it's a normal standard inverse, meaning I was given a percentage and I want to come up with a value. Remember, there's two different forms. There's the uh, distribution and there's the inverse. The inverse says if I was given a percentage and I want a value, I use the inverse. If I was given a value and I want the percentage, I use the distribution. In this case, I was given a percentage of 5%, and I want to know what the value was. So the normal standard inverse of 1 minus 5% divided by 2. That's that formula I said. You just got to remember it. Okay? Gives me the 1.96. That is exactly where this came from right here. Okay? And then the exact same thing here. My standard error which is this uh, sigma divided by the square root of n. Here is sigma, C6, right there, standard deviation, divided by the square root of n, the sample size at C4, square root of C4. Oh, you guys can't see that. Let me zoom in. Plus, plus, plus. So the standard error 
was the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. My margin of error is my standard error times how many z values away am I? So 1.96 times 2.84 gives me my margin of error of 5.57. My mean was 97, so I'm going to subtract 5.57 from it to get my lower limit, and I'm going to add 5.57 to it to get my upper limit. So therefore, we can say with 95% confidence, based on our sample, that the actual population average will be between 91 and 102. Clear? Mm -hmm. Are you hanging in there? Are you staying awake for me? I'm awake. See, when we're in class and you, and you start to fall asleep, I can throw things at you. Still awake, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so then we just did, did the Excel version of it. And again, this one minus the confidence interval, blah, blah, blah. This is, excuse me, uh, one of those things you just got to remember when I'm using this uh, uh, confidence interval, it's one minus the confidence divided by two. Okay, now the reality is, generally, if you don't know what the U is, you don't know the average of the population, you probably also don't know what the, what the standard deviation of the population is. We start with that because it's a little simpler, and we started with the normal distribution curve, and so we continued with it. As long as we know the standard, uh, excuse me, as long as we know the population standard deviation, then we can continue to use the normal curve. If we don't know the population standard deviation, then we have to use a T curve instead, a T distribution instead. Uh, and then we will use the sample standard deviation in lieu of the population. So when we don't know this population standard deviation, we do know what our 40 samples or however many samples, we know what our 40 samples are, we know what the mean of the 40 samples are, and we can calculate the standard deviation of those 40 samples. Then we will, instead of using sigma, we will use lowercase s and use a t table instead of a uh, normal. Okay. So the way that works is okay. So the other thing to consider is degree. This is a new concept that gets interjected with the t table. And actually, I'm kind of surprised he doesn't call it the student's t table in the book. You guys all read this, right? You memorized it. Yeah, I don't right. know. I don't remember him calling it a student T table, but you might hear it, you know, with, with all of your interaction with, with heavy statistics that you run into every day. You might hear it called as a student T table. In either case, it's the exact same idea. Uh, but there's this new concept that gets interjected into it called the degrees of freedom. So essentially, you know, just like when we were doing uh, the standard deviations before, and it was n minus 1 if we were doing a sample. This was in Chapter 3, I think. If we were doing a sample, we used n minus 1. That's the exact same thing here that we're doing here with our sample, is we're doing the n minus 1, and that's called the degrees of freedom. When you look it up on a t table, uh, instead of a z table, z table, you just looked up the z value. On a t table, you look up the t value and the degrees of freedom, uh, which I think is shown. Um, somewhere, there it is, but we'll get to that, obviously. So anyway, the degrees of freedom you look up on the table at the same time, and then, you're, and then you receive a value, just like you did on the Z table, that shows a percentage. But depending on how many samples you have, your percentage is going to get uh, wider if you have a small number of, you know, it's going to be a lower percentage if you have a small number of samples. And then larger the number of samples you get, the better your percentage, the better your prediction becomes. So, anyway, sample size is key. Uh, so this is what the difference between a normal curve, this was our normal standard curve, and our T curve, and the T curve is broader. What that really means is because I've got extra ambiguity, because I don't know what my population standard deviation is, I've got more ambiguity. So I have to have a wider curve to be able to make sure that I hit 
my target inside that grid. Um, so again, my X bar, this is the same exact thing that we were doing previously, except previously I had Z here and I had sigma here. Remember, this was my standard error, and this, uh, I just made that. Hang on, there go. Oh, there it is. Standard error and margin of error. So when we were doing, when we do um, the uh, population standard deviation, I use standard error and margin of error. When I don't know the population standard deviation, I use T instead of Z and S instead of sigma. But you can see the process is exactly the same to come up with my confidence intervals. They'll just be wider when I don't know the population standard deviation. Process is exactly the same, so I'm not going to beat it up. Here is the uh, an example of the, the T table where here's my degrees of freedom. If I add a sample of 10, then I would look up nine on my degrees of freedom, and then um, there's a couple of things to point out here. This says upper tail, so there's a two-sided distribution and a single-sided distribution for a T-table. Remember when we were talking about the Z-table, we would show a line, a vertical line, and say the area to the left of that line. 88% of it was to the left of 1.2 on the standard normal curve. Um, in this case, I've got two sides on my t-table. I can look at a two-sided t-table or a single-sided t-table. Um, so here I've got 0.025 would be my confidence. So I say the 1 minus my confidence level divided by 2 is the 0.025. So I look up my... Uh, value of 0.025, my percentage, this is, you know, it's given me a percentage and it's saying what would the value be. So it would be 2.262 standard errors away. So my margin of error would be 2.262 times my standard error. Okay, like I said, same exact process. So my standard error is the standard deviation of my, of my sample divided by the square root of the number of samples that I took. 0.16 divided by 10, square root of 10, that's my uh, standard error. My margin of error, I'm 2.262 times that away. 2.262 standard errors away um, from my X bar. So my confidence level is plus or minus 11 cents of that. I, I, I kind of left out the beginning of this story, but I'm sorry about that. I took samples at 10 gas stations and said, well, the average gas price is 352. So based on those 10 samples and based on the, you know, the error, the, the margin of error that I calculated, it's really somewhere between 341 and 363. Same exact process, so I don't want to dwell on it unless you guys have questions. I'm good. 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 Thank you. Okay. Uh, so where are we? In Excel, let me bring up the next one. Close that. Close. And bring up this one. We'll pass this. Yes, we are past that. Uh, six. Yeah, that was kind of boring, but uh, let's look at it. On page 255, uh, <clears throat> the value of this is less in Excel, but I want to show it to you anyway. Uh, the intention in the book is that you're looking these up on the T-table, but in real life you don't do that. So 10% of the value is with 18 degrees of freedom. 18 degrees of freedom means you took 19 samples, and you want to know uh, – the T value for each of these cases. So I want to know with 10% confidence and 18 degrees of freedom what the T value is. Okay, so this is what I, what I want to point out here is the way you use these formulas in Excel. So the T value, again, remember the T value is if you don't know the standard uh, deviation of the population, then you would use T. But really, actually, one of the challenges of statistics isn't the concept. You, know, you can always look up, okay, how do I solve for a T value? That's the easy part. 
The harder part is when do I use the T value? Okay, so the T value is used when you're trying to do population projections, inferences about a population from a sample when you don't know the standard deviation of the population. That's when you use this formula in Excel. So again, I got the one minus uh, my uh, confidence level. That gives me the probability. And then my degrees of freedom. You guys see that little tool pop up? I'll let me do this instead. Oops. That's still too small. Anyway, probability is 1 minus 10%. So 90% is your probability that you're going to be in the range. And your degrees of freedom is 18. So that's the values that you put in there. And again, this is the inverse. You were given a percentage, and you want to come up with a value. So the value is 1.33 standard errors away. Here at 95% at 20 degrees of freedom, again, this means I took 21 samples, put that in the inverse because I was given a percentage. And uh, see, so, you know, again, I wanted to point out, I, I glanced over this, sorry. I wanted to point this out. See how I have the 1 minus C5 here? That's because I'm saying, is it greater than X? Here I'm saying less than or equal to. Remember, just like on our standard normal curve, I said, here's the line, everything to the left of it. If I want to go to the right of it, then I use this, oops, then I use this 1 minus. Because I want to go above uh, greater than X, then I use 90% because 10% of it would be less than, 90% of it would be greater. So 1 minus gives me this. In this case, I'm saying less than or equal to x. 95% of them will be less than or equal to 1.725 margins of errors to the right. Uh, here it's a little more challenging because I've got uh, between x1 and x2. Well, 90% of them are between those values. Again, so here I've got 15 standard deviations. So the important thing to note here is the uh, Excel formula changed. I had T inverse, again, inverse telling me that I want a value given a, uh, given a percentage, but now I'm looking at a two tail, okay? So, and in this case, I have a minus, I don't know if you guys can see this, right there, that's a minus because I'm looking at the left-hand tail. And then here, I have no minus, it's just equals T, because I'm looking at the right-hand tail. When I'm looking at the left-hand tail, I have equals minus T. And then when I'm looking at the right-hand tail, I look at, the important thing here is what Excel is calculating is a two-tail and here it's calculating a single tail, or a, or a uh, what is it? Let's see if they call it, or a uh, upper tail. Okay. Um, so that's the way you do those calculations using Excel. Is <laughs> if you're looking between two values, you use the two tail. If you're looking above or below a value, then you use the single tail. And if it's given as a percentage, then you use the index. And the degrees of freedom, remember that's just based on how many samples did you take. Okay, questions on that? No. Your brain's numb. Are your brains numb? Yeah. 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 Okay, why don't we, let me scan through this real quick. Let's get this in. Okay, so the, the important thing here is the more and more samples you get, the closer and closer the T-curve starts to look to the normal distribution. If you took an infinite number of samples, then the T-curve equals the normal distribution. Same exact idea is take a lot of samples and your statistics are better, and we're done. Call it a night. Oh. Any, que any questions? No. No, thank you. Okay. Let me know. Uh, so let me update you on my schedule. This is Tuesday. Thursday is my last day at residency. So next Tuesday we'll be in class 
in L204 like normal. Uh, hopefully this weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I will be able to get caught up on at least some, hopefully more, of the grading so that whether by the time I show up Tuesday night, I can give you guys uh, some more useful feedback. I will try to give you the feedback on the project part one first before I get to the homeworks or the quizzes because you'll need that to be able to, to work on project part two for next Tuesday night. Uh, isn't, isn't part two part two due before next Tuesday? Part two, in theory, is due on, you know, by 6 o'clock, uh, Tuesday the 10th. Okay. By the start of class, Tuesday the 10th. In theory. Uh, but that's under the assumption that I'm going to get you your feedback for that assignment, um, you know, let's say, by, by the middle of the day Saturday or something like that. So you guys will have a few days to look at it. I, mean, I know you guys don't look at the homework until Monday night anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we've got going forward. Hopefully hopefully, I, I really appreciate, you know, your three and the seven people that are going to be watching this video. I know. I really appreciate your patience with, with this online. I hope that it has been uh, a less than painful experience. Uh, but certainly, obviously, my school schedule has put me behind on grading, and I know that's not the position that a student likes to be in. And I hope to be able to get caught up for you quickly. It's all good. Yeah. Thank you I for doing it. this, Joel. I, I think that it's been a good experience from my side, and I hope that um, from your side it's a heck of a lot better than just trying to read the book. <laughs> it is. <laughs> all righty, guys. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank you. See you next Tuesday. All righty. Talk to you later. Yeah. <sighs>